there was a distinction between a bridge between black and white, believe it or not. Even though we worked in downtown and did work with people, there was still that, that bridge that separated us. It's all that survives of the, the black community. You know, the, the initial historic black community was much larger, maybe 90% of it was lost with urban renewal. First thing that, that African Americans in the city of Roanoke have got to realize and come together realize that they can create and develop businesses in historic Gainesboro. Gainesboro is the tree from which Roanoke sprouted. Roanoke's oldest neighborhood was a thriving African-American village until the late 1950s. Now it's teetering on the brink of extinction. Lifelong residents struggle to achieve a balance that will preserve the community's rich history and also propel it into a future of renewed vitality. In this half hour, Cox Communications is looking back at historic Gainesboro. White settlers originally established the town of Gainesboro around 1834, near what is now the intersection of 581 and Orange Avenue. When the Virginian and Tennessee Railroad chugged into town in 1852, it came through south of Gainesboro. The businesses and people soon moved to be closer to the tracks. When the whites moved out, African Americans moved into the original town of Gainesboro. It then became known as Old Lick, in reference to the nearby Salt Licks. The settlement by the tracks was called Big Lick. As the railroad grew, so did the town. In 1882, the railroad became known as Norfolk and Western, and Big Lick became the town of Roanoke. Two years later, Roanoke became a city. A railroad subsidiary, the Roanoke Land and Improvement Company, developed much of the surrounding land, including what is now Gainesboro. Many of the homes it built from 1890 to 1925 still survive today. Once the, the railroad came down here, the shops were established, modern industry began in Rome. They had uh, steel works and the shop that they built the railroad cars and so forth. So it was employment. And whites and blacks from mostly around here moved to Roanoke because I know the blacks were making maybe something like a quarter a day as tenant farmers. And the railroad salary was a dollar a day. It was four times more. As early as 1890, African Americans were living in what is now historic Gainesboro on Center, Harrison, and Rutherford Avenues. By 1900, Roanoke was the largest Virginia city west of Richmond. African Americans had moved down Gainesboro Road to Gilmer and on to Patton. By the end of the first decade of the 1900s, cities across the country were responding to the influx of African Americans by passing segregation laws. Roanoke's government did the same, stating that it was to secure for white and colored people respectively the separate location of residence for each race. In Roanoke, Ordinance 2470 passed May 9, 1911. The U.S. Supreme Court declared these segregation laws unconstitutional in November 1917. By 1920, most of Gainesboro was predominantly African American. Gainesboro's population continued to grow, as did the neighborhood's vitality. It was becoming a self-contained community. We had 
your doctor there, you had your dentist there, because Dr. Walter Clayton was a dentist, and Dr. J.B. Clayton Sr., he was a physician, and his other sons, and it was just a nice complex and, and drugstore, and we had restaurants. We could go to Do Drop Band, and then we had the Star City Auditorium up there where the uh, big bands came to play. There was a drugstore and a soda shop, a hair parlor, and a barber shop in the triangle where the Clayton property mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. When you wanted your medicines, you went to the drugstore side. If you wanted your hair cut, the men went in the front and they had the women go around the back. Mm -hmm. That was sexist, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is by going through those city directories and pulling out all the blacks, Sometimes I don't have to do it, they've already done it. Um, and seeing these businesses and names of like a black bank, who, who knew there was a black bank in Roanoke or a credit union? Land companies, real estate offices, uh, the two film production companies on Henry Street. Those are just things you wouldn't imagine. Arlene Ollie wrote African American History in Roanoke City, a compilation of records, in hopes of inspiring young African Americans. Ollie explored Roanoke's city directories for information to carry out her mission. When you look at my book, you will find the name of every black person indicated in those directories, name, address, and occupation. And through those occupations, I got so excited about different jobs because all the history I'd ever read, except for William Boxcar Brown or Booker T. Washington or some celebrity, lives were pretty mundane and sad and depressing. So it was exciting to see people had jobs at NNW, not on the tracks, but in the offices, or they owned um, businesses and employed other blacks. Gainsborough was a nurturing place. Evelyn Bethel was born on Patton Avenue. She left the area for a while to work in Washington, D.C., but returned home to share a house with her sister, Helen Davis. The fond memories are easy to recall. I enjoyed it tremendously because when you walked the block, you saw houses and you saw gardens alongside the houses, well trimmed. And we had an opportunity to go to the YWCA, which was right down here on Commonwealth Avenue. And it was just a lovely experience. We had Mr. Hudsona, he was a tailor. And we had the yeah. Warnock Auditorium there. And of course, when the artists came to town, the, 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 the whites had to stay upstairs if it was a black performer and vice versa. And sometimes they would come down and we would dance together. And it was, it was, it was nice, even though it was supposed to be <laughs> segregated. But you know, there was never any, any t big to do over it. for the railroad was 1957 at the general office. Well, High Street Church is right above that general office. And uh, I had to work on Sunday sometime. I'd sneak up there and uh, sit in the back of the church just to hear the, you know, the message of the singing. The biggest joy that I think was watching people come out of that church on Sunday and parade, you know, with nobody had cars and everybody was walking. And uh, they'd walk up there and walk up in the street, go in the hotel where you could get ice cream, homemade ice cream, I believe. Two hot dogs and, and a soda for a quarter. It was beautiful. Carl Tinsley moved to Roanoke at the age of 16 from rural Franklin County. He left at 17 to join the military and serve in the Korean War. He moved back to marry. 
Carl and Yvonne Tinsley have now been married 50 years. In those early years, segregation was a way of life, and Gainesboro was a protective cocoon. When I worked downtown, I felt safe once I crossed Henry Street. I was in my neighborhood, I was in my community. It's because uh, at that time, everything was still segregated. The 1960s were approaching. Desegregation was on the horizon, and urban renewal had already plowed through Northeast Roanoke, and the tractor was headed to Gainesboro. Arlene Ali lived in Old Northeast until she was nine. When she returned to Roanoke in 1962 at the age of 16, she found her old neighborhood flattened. The Commonwealth Project cleared land for the Roanoke Civic Center, the widening of Williamson Road, and the building of Interstate 581. The hills is what you should remember, what you can't imagine. Um, there was a hill there called Diamond Hill right behind my house. It was a small mountain. In fact, it's kind of sad that they took it away because that's where the first black school was. Among the places torn down along with all these homes and churches were Roanoke's first post office, the second oldest firehouse, an old tavern, a lot of historical buildings were torn down. The service station A. Byron Smith operated was demolished at that time as well. And that taught me a good lesson. The owners of the company, they were compensated for it. I was just a runner. So I said from here on, I'm gonna own whatever I operate. The lessons others say they learned were harder to swallow. They had been told the worst homes in the neighborhoods would be torn down and replaced. The program was this. Pfizer's funeral home used to be right there on, uh, on uh, Gainesville Road, right there at the corner of Rutherford Avenue. And, and I remember that. And they had a picture of how the community was going to look once it was, the old house was torn out and it was you know, rebuilt. And uh, I think we were looking for that. But that never materialized. They tore out the houses. And, and the thing that really got me, they tore out the best houses first. In some cases, they burned, did mass burnings of houses. Um, I talked with people who watched that happen when they were children. And the fire department would do, you know, test burnings and training sessions in these places. And, um, so really, really historic buildings and very nice houses were torn down along with, um, you know, a property that wasn't so well maintained. People didn't make very much money. This was a neighborhood of adults who were ashamed that these people were going to come in and take their homes, their churches, their schools, and just scatter them like trash all over. Whenever, wherever we could land. And I really think that had the most negative impact on this community. And I think we're still suffering from it because the trust is lost. Um, the belief that by owning your own property or by trying to be a good citizen somehow gives you importance or esteem in the community that was all taken away. People were compensated for their homes, but it wasn't enough to purchase another house. Often they were forced to take out a loan. The debt added more strife to many who worked for low wages. Mary Bishop, a reporter for the Roanoke Times, was assigned the neighborhood beat in the early 1990s. A weekend assignment to cover an old Northeast neighborhood reunion led to years of work on a story that would end up in a book called Root Shock, how Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About It by Mindy Thompson Fullalove. I spent about a year and a half um, getting to know the families and looking into the history of what happened over many years 
what happened in urban renewal. And 1,600 homes were destroyed, 200 businesses, 24 churches. Urban renewal projects started in 1954 with a $3 million project that demolished 536 properties west of Williamson Road. 452 were homes. As a part of that project, the Gainsborough School was closed and Lincoln Terrace Public Housing was built. Roanoke's white city government saw um, Old Northeast and Gainsborough kind of monolithically as a slum. And if you look in the records in City Hall, they're not listed under urban renewal. They're listed, the, the labels say, slum clearance. The disruption of African-American communities continued for four decades. Urban renewal widened Williamson Road, created the Roanoke Civic Center, the main post office, Interstate 581, the Orange Avenue 581 interchange, as well as the Coca-Cola bottling plant. Claudia Whitworth found the power of the press was no match for fire bombs and bulldozers. The Roanoke Tribune, started by her father in 1939, lost all of its archives when the city leveled the building. In the late 1970s, Whitworth says the city suggested she get a loan to move the paper from its Gainsborough office. That was the only conversation, but then after that came the firebombing. They firebombed it one day when we went out of there. And um, I say they because here again, my street sources, they even tell me who did it. The firebomb damaged the Star City Auditorium. The Tribune underneath suffered water damage but did not miss an issue. In August 1983, the African American newspaper had no choice but to move. They had an organization, an affiliate, and uh, I was used to do their notarization in this. And I was over there that evening, I left, they said they had some papers they wanted me to notarize, and I left. The Tribune went by over in the little area where Hill Street Church is, they were over in there. And uh, was, we were just sitting there talking, and he was talking about they were, the Star City was kind of, you know, book to go kind of a thing and I said now don't forget I'm sitting up under that he said oh you know we're gonna take care of you you know you don't have to worry about that the very next morning so I, they said do you know they bulldozing this, this the Tribune the Star City very next morning again Whitworth did not miss an issue she had just converted to a photo processor which was set up in her ailing father's bedroom Coming up, neighborhood preservationists hope historical designation will save their community. Uh, I just hope that we can get some stuff done with Gainsborough, so we're not just talking about its history, but it's, it's life. People with common uh, musical tastes, have, especially blues and jazz and this kind of thing, have always integrated because it's voluntary. They do it because they have something in common they love and do well and respect one another. And they respect the instruments and the art and, and not what color a person is. So that was the original integrator. Henry Street was the entertainment center of the African-American community. Whites would cross the bridge to hear Dizzy Gillespie, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Fats Waller, and others. These entertainers stayed at the Dumas Hotel. In 1923, Albert F. Brooks opened the Strand Theater. It housed the Oscar Michoud Film Corporation and the Congo Film Company. Entertainment was another industry. You know, people that had uh, taverns were influ influential because they provide a service and you know, their community leaders. And then some of the people associated with the entertainment promoted these films at about 300 movie theaters that would show, segregated of course, that showed the black films. 
On the other side of Gainesboro was the next generation of world leaders. The 400 block of Gilmer Avenue provided extraordinary leadership for the community and beyond. It was a place where children learned they had the power to change the world. The Pentecost House at 401 Gilmer is where civil rights attorney Oliver Hill was nurtured. Oliver Hill boarded there, and he, he was there because his mother knew he'd get a better education here than the other places, the other options they had. By the way, that house is in the process of being purchased by the Oliver Hill Foundation. He's, he's going to be 100 in May, and they're going to take some more. And he's the one that keeps talking about all the positive life, positive self-image and so forth in Gainesville. Dr. Edward Dudley grew up at 405 Gilmer Avenue. The son of Roanoke's first African-American dentist served as Assistant Attorney General in New York in 1942 and was appointed by President Truman as the ambassador to Liberia. Dudley was the first black U.S. ambassador. 411 Gilmer was home to Dr. James H. Roberts, a surgeon who was one of the founding members of the Burrell Memorial Hospital Association. Dr. Roberts' daughters still live there today. Rufus Edwards lived at 415 Gilmer. The brakeman for Norfolk and Western was a railroad labor organizer. These houses were built between 1890 and 1905 and still stand today. This historical information stopped the city from demolishing more homes in Gainesboro in the early 1990s when it wanted to create a new road to the renovated Hotel Roanoke. The area was named to the Registry of Virginia Landmarks on September 14, 2005, and to the National Register of Historic Places on November 16, 2005. While the area was receiving historical designation, Roanoke and federal officials were deciding on a new location for the Social Security Building. The proposed site on Wells and Gainesboro has angered many residents. Uh, we're fighting now uh, for that uh, industry because that's the last plot of land. It all goes back to the land, the land, how it came to be, and our uh, people did go to court and try to get it back, but they couldn't do it. So if, you, if, if we could go forward and have something pr productive for our community and this city at large, but we must have open and honest trust with city administration. It's an office building. I have about 200 employees in it when it's fully occupied. We think that having a, a business there or an office building that generates that kind of commercial activity is a positive thing for the neighborhood and for the city. Um, we think it's important to maintain those couple hundred jobs in, in the city and downtown. Uh, and we think that's a, a good location for that. Uh, a lot of work has gone into the design process so far to ensure that the building's exterior design, its placement, its setting. With that social security, building coming in that tiny little two block strip, nothing could be done because the security that is required around a federal building would wipe out everything. Mm -hmm. You couldn't park, you couldn't come near, there's no reason for anybody to come up there. You wouldn't be able to get, you got your hotel Dumas there and you might get one, two more things up there, but you wouldn't be able to park near it, go near it, who would come? The inaccessibility, it's, it's just that would be the final nail in the coffin. You have to get agreement from the State Historic Preservation Office and the GSA and the city on this memorandum of agreement related to the design and development of the project. That's a major one that has to be concluded to the satisfaction of those parties in order for the federal agencies to have the okay to spend the money on the, on the lease of the building. So. That's a key component that has to be wrapped up in order for the project to move forward. Neighborhood residents are hoping the old Henry Street Business District will come to life once again with a pharmacy, grocery store, and restaurants. State Delegate Ansley Ware and his law partner, Melvin Hill, moved their practice to the old Moses store at 325 Jefferson. We decided to invest in this piece of property for several reasons. It's a great piece of property. It's a great location. But the bigger reason is this. Uh, nobody's gonna restore this community uh, for African Americans. If, if we feel like we want to bring back and retain certain things that they enjoyed 40, 50 years ago, 
quite frankly, it's going to have to be led by African American leadership. I think the city, what the city is trying to do uh, is, in all areas of the city, is make sure people get back to the neighborhood concept. And if you're in the neighborhood, you can, you can walk to, your, to the lawyer. We can become the neighborhood lawyer. Gainsborough is being targeted for community development block grant money. In 2001, a panel of Gainsborough residents and city officials developed a comprehensive plan for the neighborhood. Chris Chittam, Roanoke City Planning Administrator, says work in Gainsborough has already begun in the form of home rehabilitation and will have a lasting impact on the neighborhood. Well, a lot of different ways, but again, it goes back to our goals, which are uh, economic development. We want to eliminate blight, uh, increase home ownership, uh, and obviously the value of the housing in the neighborhood. Public safety is a big component. Uh, so we hope that it, it benefits Gainsborough in a comprehensive way, so that uh, not we don't necessarily focus in just one aspect of, of the neighborhood, but the neighborhood as a whole. Blue Ridge Housing Development Corporation has done and plans to do more work in the Gainsborough neighborhood. The nonprofit helps create home ownership opportunities for low to moderate income families. On Harrison Avenue, Blue Ridge has built four homes and rehabbed one. It has five additional projects on Fairfax Avenue. The next house will be at 325 Gilmer. It's a modular construction, a design from the C2C Home Design Contest. The designs for this contest needed to be affordable, environmentally friendly, and fit into Roanoke's historic neighborhoods. We've <laughs> gone through this year together trying to come up with something that would meet our budget, their guidelines, and the neighborhood standards. And this is what we came up with. Some of the products used in this home include James Hardy fiber cement siding and lumber from sustainable forests. It's a two-story design with a front porch that will fit into the Gilmer area. On Gilmer Avenue, every house that we build will be two-story, probably three bedrooms, two baths. Not this exact design because uh, Gilmer is diverse and we want to keep up with the neighborhood character. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got some really good ideas for historic-looking homes that will look really great in that neighborhood. It will take more than bricks and mortar to rebuild Gainsboro. Those who have lived and observed Roanoke history say healing is a necessary step in creating a prosperous star city. There needs to be a very careful, thoughtful, guided exchange of memories so that everybody understands each other, maybe for the first time. Why there's so much sadness, why there's distrust, History is real. It existed. These things did happen. Um, unless we discuss it, I don't think the shame or the guilt or the anger will ever go away.